Good evening. My name is Shorya Kumar. I'm the chair and the associate professor in the Department of Print Media at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening program featuring Rux Media Collective, a group founded in 1992 by three practitioners, Jibesh Bakchi, Monica Narula, and Sudhabhatta Sen Gupta, all based in New Delhi, India. Tonight's presentation is co-produced by SAIC's Visiting Artists Program and Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series and the Stamps Gallery at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. After the presentation, Rux Media Collective will be joined in conversation with Shrimoy Mitra, director of the Stamps Gallery at the Stamps School of Art and Design. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce you all to our distinguished speakers and a special delight to have all three of them present with us to share their work and journey with us. In response to the question, who is Rux as published in the book, It's Possible Because It's Possible, Rux described themselves as, I quote, a being with six eyes, six hands, six feet, one vagina, two pair of testicles, three tongues, and half a mind to get behind queries like this to ask whether, instead of having to offer a confession, Rux can simply be rarely asked questions. The name itself suggests that the very process in which they work, instead of asking the frequently asked questions or the FAQs, the name suggests a continuous engagement and fresh inquiry through rarely asked questions or Rux. Drawing, photography, sculpture, filmmaking, writing, projection, public intervention, lecture performances, and collaborations all come before us, layered upon one another, cutting against each other, and all expertly composed and presented, offering answers to questions what, how, and why, where the products or the artworks are only the articulation of this process of inquiry. Rux has been rarely described as artists, media practitioners, curators, researchers, editors, and catalysts of cultural processes. Just in the last 10 years, their work has been exhibited in over 30 solo exhibitions at venues, including Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha, Qatar, Fritz Street Gallery, London, Tate Modern, Lomia Sculpture Park in St. Louis, Proa Buenos Aires, Argentina, School of Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, RISD Museum, National Gallery of Modern Art in Delhi, Institute of Contemporary Art, Singapore, Walker Art Center, among many other institutions. In addition, they have installed projects in biennials and triennales around the world, including Documenta, the Venice Biennale, Istanbul Design Biennale, Houston Photo Biennale, Kiev Biennale, Lisbon Architecture Biennial, Chennai Photo Biennial, International Film Festival in Netherlands, and Guangzhou Triennale, among many others. Rux has also curated a number of exhibitions and projects, including the most recent 7th Yokohama Triennale, and the 11th Shanghai Biennale in 2016, among many other projects. In 2001, Rux co-founded the Sarai program and the Sarai Reader Series at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi, along with Professor Ravi Vasudevan and Professor Ravi Sundaram as directors of the program. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Jibesh, Monica, and Sudha from Rux Media Collective. Hi, we are Rux Media Collective, and we are speaking to you from Delhi, where we live. It's pretty unusual for us not to be physically present in the same space when we speak together. Uh, today we are recording in all of our different homes. And it is pretty unusual for us not to be in the same space as the people we are talking to. That is you. I'm Jibesh Bhakti. And I'm Monica Narula. I'm Shuddha Brata Sengupta. And now you can put a name to our voices. We want to thank the hosts and organizers of the Penny Stamps speaker series for this occasion to think through some of the work and the thinking that we have been doing for the last 25 odd years. So let us begin from where we are, both present and absent. Elephant Tales, Rux Media Collective. In an ancient urban village in the southern part of our city, there is a studio with a blue floor. And this is where we were. This is where our working table, the stage of our arguments, and our unwieldy and archive sits, waiting. For the past five months, this studio has been appeared, appearing intermittently in our dreams because we haven't been there in person. So it comes to us instead. The lockdown has kept the studio locked in on itself. And we have met every other day online to share ideas, to argue, to plan, to schedule and reschedule everything, including the writing of this talk. 
The rent and an electricity meter, however, keep clocking. Confronted with the dereliction of a once great city, a conjuring elephant who had been the star attraction of a traveling circus that had fallen on hard times, decided to entertain all that remained. He was the lone survivor of the mysterious catastrophe that has befallen the city. A stranded beast usually alerts us to a narrative of time, marked by disjoint, untimeliness, inertia, and deferral. Elephants were war heroes in our history books. A hundred years ago, they stood in rows at the Delhi Darbar that accelerated imperial grandeur and regional subjugation. Around the end of the last century, they appeared as a mascot in regional transnational games, a shared symbol of pride, potential, and innocence. From then on, from being the humble mount of the god of labor and technique, Vishwakarma, the elephant was said to have woken up and rising, ferried the hopes and lives of, of a billion to new heights. In the last decade, however, the beast has been having a tougher time. Mostly forgotten, sometimes feared for having lost its tamed self. We started a conversation with the deep sea divers in our heads quite some time ago. This happened first during the making of a work called The Last International in 2013. It was also a strange time. There were other voices around us then of a time traveling rhinoceros lost in a Mediterranean shipwreck, a robot poet, a field of mathematical cacti, and whispers arising from crowds that were standing their grounds in city squares all over the world. We saw each other again for the first time in Engela. We saw each other again for the first time in Engela. We saw each other again for the first time in Zukati. We saw each other again for the first time in Bari. We, we saw each other again for the first time in Zogotima. We saw each other again. We saw each other again for the first time in Zogotima. We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in Neptune. We saw each other again for the first time in the first time in Neptune. We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in We saw each other again for the first time in Listening to these voices, the question, what is it that is common between us, held our thought. Over 2018 and 2019, we walked the city of Athens and listened in to find more about an ancient shipwreck off the island of Antikythera, discovered by sponge divers more than a hundred years ago. Underneath the sea, like in the contemporary moment, distinctions between experiential highs and lows, between depth and altitude get confused and occasionally reversed. To go low is to reach high. The seeming eternity of mesopelagic twilight makes temporal distinctions between now and then and the future seem suspended in a liquid timelessness. Present blurs into the future all the time, and future bleeds into the present 
a little bit at a time. A drinking cup salvaged from that ship that had founded 2,000 years ago had the word pamphilos etched on it. We wondered if the cup named a person or a way of living as a friend of all or both. We met archaeologists and deep sea divers. We also met scholars, poets, teachers, migrants, doctors, nurses, researchers, dramaturgs, lawyers, and pharmacists. We met people tending to the shipwreck of the everyday, of scavenging capitalism. In free clinics, in hospitals, in volunteer-run language schools, in self-organized cafes, and in parking lots turned into parks. It was a lesson in diving into an ongoing massive experiment with living that has occupied the time of an entire planet, even while it is besieged. They seem to, to us to be carrying the cup of Pamphilas with them as they navigate the turbulent waters of this time, experiencing methane, the lightness that comes from drinking, as well as the dizziness that is part of the sensation of Methevitos, the rapture of the deep. Metis, goddess of contingent knowledges, daughter of the sea, patron of the skill and knowledge of sailors, swallowed by a fearful Zeus, appeared in our conversation as a form of intelligence that confronts the permanence and universality of dominant sovereign power. In finding Metis, we found the sensibility of the practical wisdom of friendship. You could call it the luminosity of friendship. The text where Svetlana Boehm speaks of luminosity called the sonography of friendship became one of our sources for the thinking that we did for the Yokohama Triennale. In the essay, Boehm is particularly interested in thinking through the covenants of female friendship. It is about the steady hand that holds out and opens the door to another, and then another, and another as a cascade of relaying luminosities. Luminous space where men and women come out of their origins and reflect each other's sparks is the space of humaneness and friendship that sheds light on the world of appearances that we inhabit. In other words, friendship is not about having everything illuminated or obscured, but about conspiring and playing with shadows. Its goal is not enlightenment, but luminosity. Not a quest for the blinding truths, but only for occasional lucidity and honesty. A form of knowledge that grows out of the jostling of untranslatable experiences. In the Middle Ages, there is a traffic of ideas, images, stories, and concepts between South and Central Asia and China, Korea, Japan. It is carried by itinerant autodidacts, monks, nuns, heterodox thinkers, merchants, sailors, pilgrims, fugitives, and slaves. A description of rare events, an account of their signs and how to repulse them, of elephants, their deaths in a state of rot, their conditions and their diseases, of music, the melodies, modes, and 108 rhythms and their merits and demerits of the mystical journey, meditation, ecstasies, miracles, and 14 houses given by the Sufis. Nujum al-Ulum, Science of the Stars, a 16th century astronomy manual from the kingdom of Bijapur in South India, proposes stargazing as a form of medicine for the care of friends. The text takes its bearings from a melange of concepts and practices that originate in Indic, Arabic, Persianate, Turkic, and Semitic bodies of working knowledge. In the expansive universe of the Nujum al-Ulum, there is nothing so big or proximate that it is also not simultaneously small or distant in relation to something else. There is an acceptance of a delicate web of actions Every creative act, every inquiry can be a source of transformation. Every transformation describes a moment that can inform a deliberation. 
Wet, Wet the, the knife. knife. Find the vein. Skin the hide. Ask, Ask the, the gods, gods to try again. again. Find the vein. Wet the knife. Skin the hide. Try again to ask the gods. Skin the hide. Try again to wet the knife. Ask the gods. Find the vein. Wet the knife. Iron makes all life as we know it and death possible. It is the secret of metabolism, of growth, of aging, which is only another word for the rust or oxidation that breaks down living cells, of death. Iron runs in our veins, helps us breathe, gives strength to muscle. DNA, which encodes life, would not bind to that iron. Death, which occurs when the rate of cell death outpaces cell formation, is also a function of the presence of iron in our bodies. Iron is a clock that winds us up and slows us down. The blood of stars builds connections between different forms of life and animate and inanimate matter across time horizons. The work was located inside Staatsbergen Cave, a decommissioned Swedish military and communication facility from the Cold War era, and it was a walk in 10 scenes. Aided by varying intensities of light as well as clouds, the walk goes along a meteorite falling from the sky, iron excavated from earth, abandoned bunk beds, wall graffiti, telephones, ethnographic film from the 40s, music video from the 80s, found TV footage, war charts, death reports, analog telephone exchanges, fungal growth, and a bundle of keys. Voices converse. The cave falls in on itself. Airplanes rust, having fallen from the sky. Reindeers run, and a snowman waits for aliens. The walk red meteorites for clues about the stains at the edge of every sharp blade that cuts into flesh. It thinks with iron, a residue from the formation of the universe, sleeping deep inside the earth, and its pores from the veins of warm blooded animals. Meanwhile, mountains turn into caves, cities rise to claim a mine, men turn into miners. Tunnels perforate the bedrock of yesterday. It is today forever for a while, as if tomorrow never comes. The miners sleep, the miners wake, the miners celebrate. Miners mourn. 
the x minus r squared. Sara loha un logon ka, apni keval dhar. All the iron for them to mine, the razor's edge alone is mine. The animal told jokes, did headstands, and carried on a practice ringside banter across 15 of the abandoned city's 23 official languages. Nobody heard the elephant, but that is beside the point. It is, however, said that solitary lampposts were so entranced by the demonstration of memory, reasoning, juggling, and calculation that the elephant adroitly performed that they lit up on their own accord. Traffic islands blossomed when the witness did acrobatic feats and pavements that has always been askew found new sympathetic alignments. A door that had been forever padlocked in a warehouse suddenly found itself ajar. There were many other minor miracles that went unreported. In nature, nothing acts in a pure and isolated state. A combination of impure states combine together as a concatenative force and move into an activation analogous to an entourage effect. A debated concept in therapeutic pharmacology which argues that components act much better in a relational field of interaction and combination with others than in isolation. This gives rise to a milieu formed through force fields of epiphytic play, contagious displacements and contaminated alterations. One terrain that our artistic and curatorial work interlaces is around the idea of the gathering. In our artistic practice, we have experimented with many forms of crowds and thickets. Thinking through the thicket that we are part of and have engendered, we can feel a kind of contrapuntal rhythm that has organically established itself between our art practice and our curatorial practice. Since Sarai, initiated in 2000 at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi, we have been arguing and experimenting with an infrastructural mode of practice. This was to keep questioning the boundary conditions of knowledge and of art, and to shift the protocols and thresholds of entry and enlarge the dialects of participation. Our curatorial practice has become an intense site of furthering this questioning and a commitment to its implications. And our artistic practice has delved into finding ways to narrate and to unearth shifting narratives of place and time, multiplying perspectives and reordering foregrounds. And to do this with a kind of fictive play and the charge of images, objects, and words. These tendencies parse and draw in riddles, tales, landscapes, devices, maps, figures, and encounters. Do you have some time? Perhaps a few minutes? Are you listening now? Can you reach down under everything? and listen to what is going on? Yes, there. I don't hear much. I don't hear anything. If it's not being said, it's not being said. What if it is being said and it's just that it is not being heard? I wouldn't know what to say to that. Are you saying I'm hard of hearing? I didn't say that. Did you hear me say something that I didn't say? You didn't say it in so many words. How many words did I say it in? 
Do you have a measure for meaning that tells you what someone says, even if they didn't say it in so many words? I don't know where this is going. Does it amount to the same thing? Something left unspoken and something that is said, though no one has heard it? I couldn't say. I wouldn't hazard a guess. Is there a difference? Does it matter if there is? What do you think? Would you walk away from it? Would you stay? Sitting? Waiting? Would it exasperate you to try and find out if there is a difference? And then decipher the difference? I could think about it. Would you risk not understanding what you heard? Or what you did not hear? Would you admit it? Is there a no admission sign? No admission without comprehension? What about no comprehension without admission? What comes first? Hearing or understanding? Hearing, obviously. So what does it mean when we say, I am not hearing that? Or even, you are not listening to me? It means someone is making a decision not to hear something. Why? Because they think it's a waste of time. So they know what it is. They have understood it before they heard it. They didn't hear it being said in so many words, but they knew what was being said. So there is a measure. I see. Now, what comes first? Understanding or hearing? You're confusing things. Does it worry you to listen? Would it help if you sat back and stopped worrying so much about what you might hear and what you didn't? And would it help if I asked you again? We are the generation that had to start the process of living with the World Wide Web. It inaugurated our understanding that infrastructure is decisive, that it needs to be shared, that it grows with an extensive public life, and that it has to be questioned and continuously innovated on. It is a practice in thinking as to how nodes are constituted and how they entangle other nodes as they move in epiphytic, parasitic, and morphing ways. This creates a generative and a threshold challenging movement of words, images, sounds, codes, and platforms, and gatherings, sustaining, restive, defined, patient, and gregarious modes of being.
It was in those days when the joke about us was that we were Sarai by day and rocks after twilight that we got invited to present our work within contemporary art. This gave us the space to test unconventional modes of arraying images and sculpting arguments in order to delve into the spectral world of shadows and premonitions and to speculate on the not yet. In the course of the last few months, a tiny virus, an unliving being, has emerged, upending assumptions and assigning a task to our entire species. We, all the billions from all parts of the world, have to undertake, in awareness of each other, the remaking of forms of life. It has brought to the foreground the necessity of reapprehending the world. Yes. And next to this work, uh, there's Kenzin. Twilight. Beautiful installation. It's like a series of wall, walls and rooms uh, with views looking in or out. Again, that sort of um, shifting of uh, assumptions about uh, borders, about whether you're inside or whether you're outside. And so you can't. Uh, you move and it sort of respatializes completely into again the whether it's space within a domestic area or not whether it's a room or just a wall it's also twilight it's that idea of the light um, the, the light yeah, the, the twilight light, the lamb and the sort of yeah yeah well, she's been exploring the idea of twilight for some time because yeah. dusk is a time of um, existential crisis almost in a way and this is part of her long-term um, research and sort of ex and experiential forays on how to express that, uh, the dread almost that comes with twilight sometimes. And also incredibly beautiful moment. Yes. And outside of his, her Kenzie's installation, there is a large film projector. This is a 35 millimeter film looping this large looper. This is Rosa Barba's work, bending into earth. Uh, this is, you know, you, we saw that archeological dig and so there, there is a kind of a, this is a kind of the impossibility of the archeology span of the future. Uh, here, Rosa takes on a incredible toxic uh, kind of sites and radioactive sites and produces for us an incredibly poised image of that which cannot yield archeological results. And if it yields, it will be threatening to us. And it is also, and it's also a, a kind of a reading and a, and a, and a critical unpacking of the language by which uh, modernity produces and talks about his own toxicity. Can you just stand here for two, for one minute, um, Eric Osana? I just want to sort of, this, this, this moment of everything. This moment, yeah. Okay. Which has been very important in the way we were sort of spatializing this room. A space which is full of light, which is luminous light in a way. It's not really about lighting up anything, but simply sort of seeing things from the glow of their own capacity, which is, of course, the artwork, but not only the artwork, the artist too. Yeah. We are now in the afterglow of an unfamiliar, viral, and partly unreadable time, and are without familiar protocols. Alone and collectively, we have to navigate the oscillation of scales quickened by the alteration in familiar rules. We are now immersed in a turbulent flow whose pressure rides to us all. And the afterglow is also a sight. It is the exhibition where you walk through deliberations with artists, activating an autodidactic impulse for the sensing and making of the spectrum that arches from our inner to our cosmic worlds. Autodidacts learn and unlearn everything. If necessary, they become misfits in relation to all that is given and taken for granted. 
because when all the functions and instructions that are written into the manual for fixing a world can't be fixed, they must be altered. In the source book to the Yokohama Triennial, we say, the care of life and the care of the self are not possible without care with toxicity. We have to think about our sickness, our awful, and our residues of the cycles of consumption and production without cruel partitions masked as destiny. Each hillock of refuse on the outskirts of a city represents a demand made by the present on the future with no promise of recompense until the archeologists come calling. The splitting of the luminosity of care from the shadows of the toxic is detrimental to the future of life on this planet. In the preface to his book, Fascinating Hindutva, 2009, Badri Narayan, an anthropologist with remarkable insight on caste mobilizations and transformations, narrates a folk tale. He had heard this in a village called Shahabpur in Uttar Pradesh. This is a luminous tale about a glorious bird called Lalmuni, who sings for all, and a troubled king, who on advice from a holy man, a swami, wants Lalmuni the bird to sing about him, the king, and narrate all events through him. The king keeps trying, but the Lalmuni bird remains unmoved, and the battle is on. The folktale captures, in a marvelous way, the riddle of sovereign power's eternal trouble with a poet's heretical flights. The work of artists, of scholars, of all kinds of practitioners of speech and images is to earn a place somewhere in Lalmuni's world. It is a challenge and a calling, and it cannot be resolved. The question then is, how to trace, both to find and to draw out the lines of the fleeting, the contingent, the discontinuous, of that which did not obey the epistemic rules of its time. How to celebrate epistemic disobedience? No one quite knew, for instance, how to exhibit a soot black sourdough square of calcified moldy biscuit, which was located in the storage shelves of the People's History Museum in Manchester. Baked during the days of the Paris Commune in 1871. It had sat, this biscuit, in a cardboard box for close to a hundred years. We took it out, scanned it, to generate a 3D printed negative mold, and then use that to bake new biscuits. The moldy biscuit became a conduit to another taste of time. In this way, the elephant was able to momentarily transmit and transfer its general sentience to a metropolis that had become as barren of consciousness as the moon is of life. And so, that which appeared lifeless was quickened into animation. The elephant found enlightenment within its grasp in that limbo between appearance and essence. And its innate compassion prevented it from living the city to its mute posterity. And so the magnificent beast left its shadow on a wall. The city fell asleep again, dreaming that an elephant had come to entertain. Thirty-one days. What we call a handwritten signal is gleaned from the habit within rocks of a regular chatter. The daily back and forth of things seen, heard, read and sensed between three people across decades. From the dawn of new feelings to the obstinate sediment of images that do not let themselves be unseen. Disappearing ephemera, 
a history in the making. The scene that unfolds in the corner of the eye. Everything and nothing. Real, imagined, and everywhere in between. Notes taken of pictures that whisper, speak in tongues, and sometimes leap from hibernation to upheaval. We wait. The weight of these months and days will stay and unravel in unknown ways. The world and our interconnected consciousness will inherit a complicated and turbulent combination of debts, risks, voices, and futures. We will need to find new ways of speaking and respect new dialects which are in the making. Short of breath, we hope we will not be short of time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monica, Shuddha, and Jibesh. Um, my name is Shramoy Mitra, and I am the director of Stamps Gallery, uh, part of the Penny W. Stamps uh, um, School of Art and Design. Um, so I have the great honor uh, to, uh, to engage in, in a conversation uh, uh, with each of you um, to take us through, um, you know, and thank you so much for taking us through the sort of um, really expansive um, and, um, and breathtaking body, um, you know, bodies of work. What really strikes me, and I thought perhaps you can, uh, you know, we could start there, um, is to tell us a little bit about um, your process. So can you tell us a little bit to take us through, um, uh, you know, the sort of how you source your sources. I know this is a pretty um, open-ended, large question, but I'm really struck, um, you know, with the source book. And you know, I've read in sort of um, you know various interviews, um, you, you know, thinking about um, you know a place of starting in your curatorial practice, perhaps, is from sources. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about? Um, or can you tell us a little bit about sourcing or source materials and your process and? And the sources start about like has been there. Uh, we've become conscious of this process of the source over the last few years. It has been the part of our practice, uh, along with the infrastructure gathering source has been also there. But in the last few years, we've become aware about trying to move away from a very thematic construction of the world where the curator, because of the curatorial, this question keeps on coming up. Mm -hmm. So how do you escape a kind of thematization and illustrative logic to practice, logic to practice not only the self, but practice of others? And then through that, with our, our, we have been trying to grapple with this. And wrestling is a good word, wrestling, and because it, it is a, has been a difficult uh, process. But in that process, we came to an understanding that through working over a period of time that we have actually started working through sources. And only in the last few years, we understood that the work has been through sources, that we actually exchange sources with our co-artists and with between ourselves mm -hmm. to start building a conversation, to start weaving conversation, mm -hmm. to start seeing. And this whole logic, what Monica once framed it between us was that it's called the spectrum logic, that you actually start expanding the spectrum uh, around the source. You don't try to explain, define a source. And and that expansion of the spectrum allows the source to then pull in other sources and give a good example of this in this, that the scenography of friendship uh, of Svetlana Baum became a very interesting way of weaving sources with sources mm -hmm. through the idea of the care of the friend. So it starts knitting. So what happens is that one source becomes 
meter of other source and the other source becomes expansive and drawing in other sources. So you actually you unleash a form of thinking around you with co-creators, something that you are quite surprised by yourself. I think being in a collective, um, what I like about the, and as Jibish said, we've only become more aware of the, or self-aware of the process, I would say in the last few years, but what is nice about this, this, this method that, you see, it, because it's a propositional method, it's not, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say it as much as it asks. And in that process of asking, it, uh, it, it, um, it, it assumes that a conversation will happen, that there will be something which will come back. And that, I think the fact that we are a collective, I think is, uh, this was a method we must have found because obviously we, you know, what is intuitive to the self, how do you share that? And how do you share that without it being descriptive or kind of definitive? You want to share that in a way that is able to pull uh, the other person's intuition, the other person's thought, the other person's feeling to come along with yours. So I think that aspect of the, the propositional aspect of sources, the, the, the fact that they, that they are open and they allow for other kinds of uh, unexpected resonances to emerge. That is, I think, one of the reasons why this method is something that we've been working with for, I, I, I guess, all our, I mean, all our working lives together. But I would say in the last few years, we've become much more self-aware of it. Um, like Monica said, there's this business of the unexpected resonance. And that takes me to um, a word that we, one of us, I think, I don't remember which one of us said during the course of this lecture, it's a word we've invented called the Anarchive. I think right at the beginning, we said uh, our studio waits at the Anarchive. And the Anarchive is, is an anarchic archive. And it is so because it, it, um, it, it avoids the question of creating a classificatory hierarchy of different kinds of knowledge or different kinds of um, source. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about this unexpected resonance, it's because um, the source may come from a philosophical text, but it may also come from a reading, a careful reading of a telephone book. Mm -hmm. It may come from reading numbers carefully. Jibesh, for instance, is very a diligent reader of GDP figures. He gives us GDP figures all the you time. Are doing well now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well, but but yeah. everything that ranges from the football score of the little local club to the to the national GDP figures to um, to an understanding of infinity and infinitude, just to take the idea of numbers, for instance, um, which is something that we've thought about. So all these different orders of and the different registers, and they all have different emotional and affective registers. For instance, if you're talking about number, mm -hmm. then the affective emotional register of infinity is very different from you know, a constrained number that seeks to denote people in a particular census. So these can all be sources, but when they jostle with each other, they produce effects that we may not have been able to predict. Um, and perhaps I wondered if you could um, kind of talk a little bit about that, um, um, you know, uh, in, in um, that sort of how those logics sort of informed um, a work um, like in Blood of Stars, um, you know, because uh, there um, obviously you were, you were at a site, a specific, a very specific military site in Sweden, um, the space that hasn't been used, um, you know, I would imagine a very spectral sort of space, um, um, you know, kind of, I don't know, hauntings or coastings of the space in there. I don't know, just what, you know, when I watch the work, it's sort of, um, um, and so, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that work and how that came to be, um, and then your decisions in, um, in the films and the installations, um, you know, sourcing from the space, um, but then also bringing something within it. Um, uh, I really like how you speak, Shreem, where you bring so many things together, but uh, from spectrum to spectral. So there's, as you say, the haunting, the, that which is not present. And of course, uh, the idea of listening, the, you know, the, the, the fact that you are not always taking your cue from that which you, you think you can see and therefore understand, but listening demands that there's a certain other kind of register of attention, which is really um, very important. Um, 
and uh, and of course the other idea of the, of the spectre, which is haunting so much of the present world uh, and its and contemporary politics. But speaking much as so all of these things, I think this 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 uh, the spectrality definitely is you know is part of our practice. is very much a part of of how we think um, and how we listen, and of course listening to each other. But speaking more specifically of the blood of stars. Um, it's actually a complete example of something like this because in in, in it was an, it was it was a, it seems like a short film now I don't think it's like less than twenty minutes but it took it took us almost two years to make and it involved many trips to the Arctic Circle mm-hmm. um, and what is interesting is you know um, the first one of us first went saw some things saw the caves saw other places too there were many options available. Uh, had a certain order of encounter with the landscape, came back and and talked about it. And we all heard, even if um, what could not be said the most, you know, if, no matter what the words were, we also heard the excitement about, you know, what 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 was uh, what was sub, sort of uh, spectrally uh, uh, exciting. Like you don't necessarily know what is exciting you, but you know it is very exciting, and you have to be able to listen to that in in, in your colleague's voice. And I and this is how it went on actually. Then then another and then we went back again and again to that landscape to see it in spring, to see it in deep winter, to see it in uh, when it was you know green and uh, vibrant. Um, you know the whole and you know we went into iron mines in the in the far north. We uh, we spent a lot of time, and I think that kind of experience of um, being with the landscape. And the kind of ideas that it engenders, that time that is needed uh, for things to percolate. So that's, I think, the other aspect of all of these things. You can listen and you can uh, speak in a in a different way, but you also have to give things time to cook. There's also, I mean, I think it's it's a very interesting thing that you've zeroed in on the act of listening because it's it seems to be a persistent. Um, there's a buzz around listening in our work. Um, one of the extracts that we showed today, um, the film with the with the door of an airplane against a blue sky and clouds, is taken from a work called The Measure of an Acoustic Reason. And what you hear over it in Monica's voice is a is a kind of meditation on what comes first, hearing or understanding. And it's this business of like an acoustic or an anacoustic um relationship to the world i mean for instance let's say when a when a tribunal or a or a bench in a court listens to an environmental matter what is it hearing and what is it not hearing in the hearing um, native americans for instance often when they have to prove title to land had to sing the songs of their belonging to the land and judges in canada and the united states and this happens everywhere in the world say well this can't be heard and it's a telling sign of what a juridical system can hear and cannot hear. A very early work of ours is called Utopia is a Hearing Aid, which means that Utopia is not some place far away. It's actually a sonic register, which you have to attend to with greater care and attention. If you listen hard enough, you will find another world in this one, speaking, whispering, stammering. So. Uh, a, f- a young friend that, you know, Sarai produced these marvelous resonances where a young friend who worked in a in the Cyber Mohalla project that Jibesh was very closely involved with once said, uh, and we, we were having a discussion about the freedom of speech. And she said, freedom of speech requires fearless speech, requires fearless listening. And that's stayed with us um, as, a, as a kind of maxim, as an ethic of how to how to relate contemplatively, but in a way that's dynamic, that's kinetic to kinetic contemplation of the world. And the last couple of questions that I wanted to just end with was, um, you know, of course, the question of time, right? Which sort of is, I mean, obviously it's part of everything we do. Um, and uh, definitely in your work, there's a deep sort of investigation of time. Um, I'm thinking of um, kind of a, one of the iconic works is the, you know, the 27 clocks, uh, which has the different, um, you know, emotions um, that, you know, 
um, but you know, using that sort of physical form of a clock. Um, but also, um, you know, as you ended your talk with, um, I hope you don't run out of time, you know, um, in, um, in this piece and the newest piece, Petty One Days. Um, and we're sort of all in this time uh, that we can, you know, what we have common now, perhaps um, across the world or, you know, in different geographies. Uh, I mean, we, we have many, but this one in particular is this idea of being in uh, isolation or in lockdown mode or, you know, within these cubes of, um, of, of, um, of Zoom. So it kind of um, um, also blurs this question of space because we can now, um, you know, while um, we can't have these conversations in person or we, we're unable to, um, but we can, all, we can still come together, which arguably we could before, you know, um, the virus, coronavirus, but, um, you know, now that has become kind of uh, um, an important and major platform. Um, but it's this kind of weird sort of, um, or the strange void space but it's also very full and rich kind of brimming a kind of a new space a new sort of non-space um, um so and i'm going into space uh while i'm what started out talking about time um but they're obviously deeply connected um and so um this you know um if you could reflect on this these um this time, um, you know, not you know, uh, not being able to go to the studio for how many ever months, um, and um, this sort of, but but our daily um, sort of minor routines, you know, which is kind of uh, whether in in thirty one days, this you know, the writing, um, uh, putting pen to paper. Um, you know, the type of, you know, uh, there is, um, it's, it's very rich, like this textures in the paper, the playfulness of the different ink, um, you know, that the character, you know, the protagonist uses to um, uh, these sort of minor rituals, which sort of um, um, uh, have kind of embodies the sense of hope um, in, you know, as I, as I, uh, watch it. Um, and so, yeah, I wondered if you could reflect a bit on time um, and how you, um, um, in and the sort of the making uh, of 31 days, uh, which, of course, as you've said, has been much longer than 31 days when you initially uh, started making it. Um, um, so, yeah, if you could talk a yeah, bit. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about time and then one of the other two will maybe coming on 31 of these. And this is related to the, your previous question. What is it that we all have in common? Mm. Um, we could, I mean, the, when we were doing research on Pamphilos, the friend of all, um, we came across mm. this beautiful fragment by Pythagoras, which says that um, it's koina tafilon, which means friends are those that have things in common, mm. right? So instead of the commons being something that you actually discover outside yourself. The commons is something that actually grows out of a relationship. Mm. And the one thing that friends have in common more than they have anything else is time. Because you can be someone's friend only if you give and receive time and share time together. Um, and in, in our case, this, this business of living through 25 plus years of practice uh, is not just a division of time, it is actually a multiplication of time. So we are whatever we are as ages, but the Rux Media Collective is actually already 75 years old wow. because it is three lifetimes of 25 each, right? Which means that it has experienced, Rux has experienced more than what we individually have experienced. And that, I think, that, that understanding that, that society or, or fraternity produces an expansion of the horizons of time is one of the most, uh, it liberates you more than anything else does. Because most of our compulsions, whether they're political or social, seem to have at bottom to do with the fact that we are all running out of time. Mm -hmm. Because it, the measure is the lifespan. 
And you never, whether it's, let's say, the environment or so on, the, the notion of a crisis has always to do with, oh God, this, has, this is happening right now and what will happen tomorrow. If we were able to, to expand our temporal horizons, maybe we would weigh things differently. And I think that's one of the things that makes us think about registers of time. It's worth its value, its feeling, which is why the, the, the work that you refer to called escapement, which is, refers to the mechanism of winding up of clocks, um, is a book of hours. And book of our, books of hours were, were a very established mode of meditative practice, art forms in medieval uh, cultures everywhere. So you have books of hours in medieval Europe, you have them in, uh, in India, you have them in China. They're all to do with repetition, with rhythm, with finding a groove in time. So um, that's one of the reasons why I think we're all so, so time, uh, untimely in our thinking about time. Maybe 31 days is one, one of the other two. Mm -hmm. Monica, 31 days. 31 days. Uh, I don't know. I it mean, to me, this is... Days. It, <laughs> well, the experience of making the work, actually, I think, um, you know, I think when the, when, 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 uh, when the world changed earlier this year, and I do not say it lightly, I think there was that sense of, like, the fact that, it, how can it be that we had to live, you know, through this? It was the, it was the Spanish flu happened a hundred years, you know, Humanity has conquered the world. Humanity has conquered other species. Every day we hear about the death of, just yesterday I read how, you know, 84% of freshwater species so have, have been wiped away since 1970, so, you know. So, the, so for good or for bad, you have reached this apex predator position. How is it that you can be so easily destroyed by something that even now I think is no more than a few grams if you include the entire world's COVID. If you weigh all the viruses, virus. they'll come to like a few grams. Wow. And so, yeah, so that's it. So then I think that that, that surprise, I think, was the biggest thing. The sort of the hubris, the human hubris of the last uh, whatever years. I definitely was kind of shocked that no matter what, like how could it, how could it be that we are going through this? And I think that led to first uh, a relationship with time that I found very, like the day was so long. Right. It, it just felt like my day was so long. I didn't have to do anything. Uh, there was nothing to be done. And, and you know, there was, uh, we had to take care of our, our own, like, basic necessities. But yet the day seemed so long. And I think that uh, was another surprise. I don't think the day has felt that long since I was a child and when I didn't have to do anything. I think this, these, some of these kind of feelings, which are, I'm sure, shared by everyone uh, everywhere, Ours. And then the fact that, of course, since we then we started, when we started writing, the day did not seem so long anymore. And the day seemed as, as actually has become as normal, as short, as full, as inadequate uh, to what you think you should be doing or what you think you could be doing or you, you uh, need to be sort of contributing towards. And then you realize that, you know, so then the question of time. And this is something so banal, time is an experience. And everyone who experiences it like love will experience it both absolutely uniquely and absolutely in the same. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this was part of all that went through into the making of 31 Days. But what was interesting was that while we were reading the same news, sitting in our three different houses, which words did we use to write it out? And how those words were sculpted in these kind of conversations, which were textual conversations often, that was also very interesting. Like just who was feeling what more, which day uh, was changing the nuance of the sentence that was going into the writing of that day. And I think that has been a very, um, quite, to be honest, quite intense experience in a very slow motion kind of way. Um, but one more thing that uh, this time question, you know, like 90s when we were uh, started our work in Sarai, you know, a developmentalist idea, there is a there is not a linear idea of time, there is a developmentalist idea of time that I think we still fight, we fought then, which is uh, something about to do with the quotient of intelligence distribution in society. And that is temporal, you know, that something will arrive at you in a sense that 
So it's kind of it divides the world in infrastructurally, and infrastructure is divided, then gives a shadow onto intelligences and the way the world culturally expresses. And now one of the big thing that and so I also used to fight it out. And this developmentalist idea of time, we structure so much of resource, so much of the propaganda, so much of imagination, of expertise, knowledge, creates havoc in people's life. Uh, it creates havoc in the way uh, uh, we, we talk and interact culturally across cultures, across uh, even castes, across uh, classes. So one of the things that I think that is not unresolved in our uh, intellectual life uh, and affair. And that keeps on battling. So even in 31 days, it's, the idea is to change the perimeter of observation. Though we are locked in our rooms, but the observational perimeter is not one of, the gradient is not one of a known gradient by which the room would be constructed. So the, the it keeps on building up and starts look, searching for a, how big is this world and how still still or losing its bearing and unmooring it is so that's also 31 days uh, so it is not that it's not a fine grain observation it is a very fine grain observation of our uh, specificity but it is also drawing that fine grain into a what we later call perimeter but not exactly a perimeter but that what is this world constituted by mm -hmm. To break this uh, logic of time, you know that you are in some order of time already. So that's there. It's somewhere. I think it's there. It's haunting it. In its writing, it is there. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. I don't. If you uh, there is, um, uh, you know, it's been really wonderful to have some time to talk to each of you um, and to all of you uh, um, and. Is there? I think we're done. Thank you. Well. Thank you. It's been wonderful.